January is in the rear view and then some, which means it is time again for me to talk about some video games. So this is what I played in January. I started off with Dave the Diver, a game that feels like it couldn't settle on exactly what it wanted to be, so it went with a bit of everything. It is honestly wild how many ideas are stuffed into it. On the surface, it seems like it only has two phases, the diving phase where you go into the water to collect fish as well as do favors for various people, and the restaurant phase where you set a menu based on the fish you gathered and then try to make as much money as possible. But as soon as you think you figured out what the game is about, it hits you with a rhythm mini game and then a boat chase and then light farming sim elements and something new always keeps coming, leaving you guessing as to what idea they'll toss at you next. To be honest though, I found myself mixed on the inclusion of all these elements. On one hand, it's definitely exciting every time something new comes up and I couldn't help but be impressed by their dedication to including so many little gameplay ideas. But on the other hand, hand, almost none of them are all that fleshed out or fun to actually do. Really, the best part about them is the reveal that they are part of the game. Thankfully, most of them don't overstay their welcome, as you only do them once, but I'm not convinced that they make the game better. I couldn't help but feel that the developers would have been better served focusing on making other aspects of the game more interesting, like the stuff that's part of the core gameplay loop. To be clear, I do think the main part of the game is somewhat successful in what it's trying to do. It's the kind of gameplay loop that provides a constant rush of dopamine by always rewarding rewarding you with something, and it is great for a while, but it does eventually have diminishing returns. Like at the heart of it, you're gathering fish so that you can sell them at the restaurant to make money, which allows you to buy stuff to help you gather more fish that you sell at the restaurant to make more money, which allows you to buy more stuff to help you gather even more fish that you can sell at the restaurant to make even more money, and yeah, it keeps going and going. The problem is most of the things you can spend money on don't make the gameplay more fun, they just make it more efficient. Also, while it expands on where you can go while diving, what happens in the restaurant stays relatively static. In fact, as you get more upgrades, you end up doing less and less while there. And that's a shame because when I started, running the restaurant was my favorite part of the game. But as things went on, I just spent more and more time in the water and barely felt like I was at the restaurant at all. There are also a few quests that require you to skip working at the restaurant for an evening. So on some of those occasions, I'd go two hours or so before doing a shift at the restaurant. And that sucked because it was the thing I was most interested in. I really wish they would have expanded on the restaurant phase of the game in some way to make it feel as important as the diving phase, because as things stand, once you get kinda deep into the main story, the restaurant becomes an afterthought, and you can pretty much fund every endeavor by selling dishes made from beating story bosses. So yeah, in terms of gameplay, there is a ton of stuff here, and on the whole, it's mostly enjoyable enough, but a lot of it does lack depth, making it so you're just engaging with stuff instead of engaging with it meaningfully. All in all, it is a charming game that bombards you with content to get swept away in, so if you're looking for a relaxing time that will make you feel good for a while, it is an easy recommendation, but I had hoped to get a bit more out of it. Oh, also, and this is the tiniest thing to be annoyed by, but it still managed to bother me, the version number of the game is always in the bottom right corner of the screen, presumably so that whenever the devs see footage of the game that has some sort of bug in it, they can better hone in on if it is still a problem or not. This is understandable and cool and all, but I didn't want to have it on my screen all the time and there's no way to toggle it off. Again, this is a small thing and obviously it's something I was able to forget about for long chunks of time, but as someone who records everything they play and wants it to look nice, it definitely frustrated me a bit. For any devs watching, please give the option to toggle stuff like this off. With all that said, the game certainly has struck a chord with a lot of people as it has sold and reviewed super well, so I hope its success shows bigger studios that forming smaller teams to develop mid-market titles can be very worthwhile for publishers, developers, and players alike. After finishing Dave the Diver, I jumped into Iron Lung, another game about deep sea exploration, but this one is fundamentally the opposite of Dave the Diver from a gameplay philosophy perspective. Where Dave the Diver is all about excess, Iron Lung is about scarcity. It is singular in its objective, and every aspect adds to cultivating a sense of dread. In it, you pilot a submarine at the bottom of a bloody ocean and are tasked with finding and photographing 10 points of interest. As the submarine is so deep, the navigation window has been shut in order to account for the pressure, so all you have to go off of are coordinates, an unfinished map, sensors that alert you to nearby objects, and a camera that can take a single grainy picture every few seconds. It is impossible to fully make sense of what is outside of the submarine, but two things that are clear almost immediately are that the ocean is vast and immensely dangerous. It took a bit to figure out the navigation, but once I got a hang of it, I found it really rewarding. There was something so powerful about needing to do stuff like trace my finger along the screen to get a sense of where I actually 
actually was. It really helped pull me in, making things feel all that much more intense. As I went from location to location, trying to make sense of what each point of interest contained and hearing the disconcerting sounds of the ocean around me, I felt so connected to the world I was exploring despite not being able to see it, which is wildly impressive. In some ways, I think it is pretty close to being a perfect game, at least in terms of succeeding in what it set out to do. There is not a wasted moment, and it capitalizes perfectly on all of its mechanics over the course of its hour-long runtime. I'm not even a huge fan of horror games, but this one had me at the edge of my seat for the whole playthrough. And like, I don't want to oversell it. At the end of the day, it is a game where you run from one end of a small submarine to the other, but I think it does a lot of neat things within the limitations of its framing device to create an immersive experience. So for anyone who enjoys games that try interesting things, there is a ton to appreciate here. In a landscape filled with titles that aim to include as many ideas as possible, it is refreshing to play one that is so focused on a single aspect and executes it expertly. To end off the month, I played Unpacking, a cute and surprisingly emotional game about growing up and the stuff that goes with it. Each chapter takes place during a different move in the main character's life, and the only information you have about her and what's going on comes from the stuff of hers that you unpack and the places she is moving into. It's incredible how much information is conveyed about her life from just these few transitional moments. From picking up on her interests, to getting a sense of what her relationships are like, you learn so much about her from the simple act of finding places to put her stuff. For a game without dialogue where you don't even really see the main character, it manages to cover a lot of ground, ranging from how a place that felt so massive as a kid can feel so tiny as an adult, to how hard it can be to fit into someone else's life, to how making space for yourself can lead to achieving greatness. The plot itself is not an especially novel one. When written out on paper, it follows a lot of beats that have become somewhat standard in coming-of-age stories, but it being told in this way brings so much life to it. It. it turns a pretty typical narrative into a mystery that you have to untangle piece by piece and box by box, and I love that. Like, the way this story is told could not be achieved in any other medium, and I adore when games embrace the full potential of what interactive media can provide. The gameplay itself is soothing and simple. I found a lot of joy in organizing the main character's stuff and getting it to look as nice as possible without resorting to stashing too many things under the bed. I wouldn't go as far as to call it a puzzle game game, but there are a few times where you have to find creative ways to store things that feel kind of close to one. My main point in saying this is that while it isn't really challenging, it is far from being mindless. Since finishing it, I found myself thinking about it a lot, as it is just so creative and effective in how it tells a story, and as someone who has moved five times in the past five-ish years, I related a lot to the energy it brings. If you watch a lot of my videos and generally find yourself aligning with my taste in games, I definitely say to put this one on your to playlist. It's a really cool title that shows off what the medium of games can accomplish. Anyway, that's all I've got. I will see you next time unless I decide to stop doing this. Bye.